John Van Dyke was a teacher. To the Van Dyke family, we bear witness to your deep and sharp grief for someone who was dad. What has surprised many of us is the shape of grief one feels when you lose a teacher that was someone who shaped your own autobiography and you see a chapter of your life passing. There are many people here today who would not have achieved what they achieved without a little push out of the nest that came from our con law professor. Um, so I'm going to call to you and ask you to stand and please, no hila hila. If John Van Dyke invited you to get your name in print as his co-author, could you please stand? Could you stand if you ever got a letter from John Van Dyke telling you what a good student you were and urging you to keep up the good work? Could you stand if John promoted you so you could get a job, wrote a letter of recommendation, made a phone call at a critical juncture in your career? Could you stand if you edited an article of your own or on the Law Journal and he stayed up with you working on footnotes and commas and content? Could you stand if you ran for office at his urging and with his support? Could you stand if you learned your constitutional law in the quarry when we were a, a law school not yet accredited by the American Association of Law Schools? Could you, if you, could you stand if you learned con law topside but before laptops in the new building? And finally, the youngsters, could you stand if you learned your constitutional law in the PowerPoint era? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the history of Hawaii. I invite you to take a look. We who learned constitutional law from John Van Dyke learned it well. The easy thing for a professor to do when someone gives a fuzzy, incomplete answer is to just move along not in John Van Dyke's class. Attention would fill the room as he stayed with someone who was giving the simplistic answer. He would gently ask another question and another question as we witnessed this torture and hoped for it to soon be over. The message he was giving you are a Richardson lawyer. I expect an intelligent answer. And this mattered because our students face skepticism about their abilities. We are the most diverse law school in the country and the first to admit women in equal numbers right from the beginning. Our graduates did not always fit the traditional conception of what a lawyer looks like. And as Auntie Joyce noted, our professors did not always look like what a lawyer looks like. When someone is waiting for you to prove your inadequacy, a fuzzy answer is not going to cut it. And John Van Dyke sent us out into the world prepared to meet and vanquish all skeptics. Others will speak about his prodigious scholarship his international reputation. I'd like to speak in specifics about someone in the Philippines who was tortured and disappeared in a time when their name was supposed to be forgotten. How the Van Dyke and Broder team in decades of litigation established a permanent principle in law we will not forget. And today, this week, there are innocents being tortured and disappeared in Syria, in Sudan. But those responsible operate with the uneasy knowledge that the law will not forget. 
I want to speak about the early days of the law school when you could count the number of Native Hawaiian lawyers practicing on your fingers. When John pushed his students to run for the Constitutional Convention and stayed up late into the night with them strategizing, how are we going to make Kanaka Maoli rights a part of our Constitution? This is a lasting legacy, and it will remain when all of us are gone. These radical changes are what the law is capable of, and they were not the product of a radical. John once said to me when we were debating a trend in legal academia called critical legal studies, he said with an apologetic shrug, I'm a liberal. Students today are accustomed to the Fox News usage under which liberal means radical, uh, revolutionary. But John was using the 60s usage under which liberals were derided by the left. They were associated with the political philosophy of liberalism, of a moderate and pragmatic commitment to enlightenment values. When John self-identified as a liberal, he meant commitment to the rule of law, to democracy, and to the sometimes slow legal process. His study of the jury system, his commitment to international law, his unheralded work on things like the right of high school students to not have their lockers, search lockers searched unreasonably, these all came out of that liberal world view. And John held this view when it was hard. During the Cold War, post 9-11, we saw 101 different ways to say Let's abandon the rule of law because there's a greater threat. John taught by example, taking on public battles to uphold the principles of democracy in the middle of the Vietnam era, the war on drugs, the war on terror, the flashpoints of his lifetime. If we celebrate today, it is for this, a lawyer's life well lived, and our pledge as his students and colleagues to follow that example. If we mourn, it is for the loss of a friend. We remember his quiet, thoughtful demeanor. Yes, so quiet that some fell asleep in class. That a fierce fighter for human rights came in such a soft-spoken package is also a teaching. Speak quietly, litigate, fiercely, love deeply. Our teacher, who after that barefoot hippie beach wedding, stayed happily married in a fully equal feminist marriage, who raised three beautiful children who walk with his same humility, taught us something also about the private side of a life well lived. Mahalo nui, John. I am a professor because you pushed me. We are better lawyers because you demanded it. And we grieve because you are gone too soon. John Van Dyke, our teacher, you are teaching us still. <laughs>